is of a student who goes to his professor and says that he wants to study philosophy. The professor says, that's fine, but do you understand what is meant by philosophy? So the student said, yes, of course, philosophy is to do with truth, meaning, the purpose of life, and important things like that. So the professor said, maybe, but that's not good enough. He said, I'm going to ask you a test question. Suppose we have two people, one of whom is clean and one of whom is dirty. To which one would you give a bath? So the student said, well, that's pretty obvious. You give a bath to the dirty person. The professor says, maybe, but that's not philosophy. That's logic. Let's try again. <laughs> uh, clean person, dirty person, to which one do you give the bath? The student again says the dirty person. Professor says, no, let me explain. The clean person is more motivated to be clean. That's why that person is clean. So the bath means more to the clean person. So you give a bath to the clean person. Now that is psychology. <laughs> he, says, he says, we'll try one more time. Clean person, dirty person, to which one to give the bath? The student says, I'm totally confused. I don't know what you expect me to answer. I don't really know what you are asking me. Professor said, that's fine. That's philosophy. <laughs> Now, the point of that story is that I'm not going to be talking about philosophy. I'm going to be talking about creative thinking, thinking for a practical purpose. There is no official thinking line to that story, so you're free to invent one. And uh, two possible ones are, from the marketing point of view, you offer the bath to the dirty person, knowing that person will refuse it. Then you give it to the clean person, so getting two satisfied customers with one bath. <laughs> From the point of view of management being the most effective use of available resources, you give the bath to the clean person who will not much dirty the water and then use the same water for the dirty person. <laughs>
that in three minutes we can get as much output as in the adversarial way it takes 15 minutes. We have believed that perception and processing are working in the same type of information universe. And in the last 20 years, we've come to realize they are not. They're working in two different information universes. This is what we'll call an active information universe, and this is what we'll call a passive information universe. And let's look at the difference between these two. In 1969, I wrote a book called The Mechanism of Mind, in which I showed how the nerve networks in the brain acted as a self-organizing system to allow information to organize itself. In those days, that was a somewhat unusual idea. Today, the central concepts of that book are central to neurocomputers, neural net machines, self-organizing systems, and so on. Self-organizing systems are a system in which the information and the surface interact to give you certain structures. I'll give you one more example. Imagine we have a um, towel which you take from the bathroom and you put on the table and alongside you have a bowl of ink. You take a spoonful of ink, you put it on the surface, leaves a stain, 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 stain. Typical passive system. The ink will stay where we have put it. Let's now contrast that with an active system. And the surface is not a towel, it's a shallow dish of gelatin. Looked at from the side, there's the dish of gelatin. We now heat up the bowl of ink on a fire, and we take a spoonful of the hot ink, we put it on the surface. While it's hot, it dissolves the gelatin. When we pour off the cooled ink and dissolve gelatin, this depression is left in the surface. We now repeat. Same sequence, same placement as before. But what we get now is a channel sculpted in the surface like that. The reason being that if the second spoon was anywhere near the first, the wetness will spread. If it finds that, it pours into that, makes that deeper, that stays quite shallow, and so on and so on. So in the end, we get this channel. In other words, this surface has allowed the incoming information to organize itself as a sequence. Now, what happens in the nerve networks in the brain, and there's no mystery about it at all, it's very straightforward behavior, that for any input, whatever, we will get a sequence of stable states. For any input, whatever. We can depict those as a channel, because it simply means we're going to flow along in that direction rather than anywhere else. So the purpose of the brain is really to form these channels, to take incoming information, put it together to give routine patterns. And that's why we can see the world around us and deal with it. Now, what happens in creativity and in lateral thinking is exactly the same. That our experience has set up the main track of perception. So we see things in the same way depending on our experience, depending on our sequence of experience. If somehow we can move laterally, that's where the word lateral comes from, we can move across patterns. When we're here, in hindsight, we can see it makes sense, in hindsight. And we're going to use a particular process of doing it, which is called provocation. Remember when I was talking about the, the sources of creativity, and I said one source was a mistake, accident, chance, madness, we can do it with provocation. But what we do in provocation is this. We set up a provocation. We set up an idea which does not exist in experience and may indeed be contrary to experience. And we use the word po, which I'll explain in a moment, to signal that. Then we move from this to that idea, on to this idea here, and then we can see it makes sense. So we need a combination of provocation and this operation we'll call movement. Movement is the willingness to take an idea and move forward from it. Movement is quite different from judgment. What happens in judgment, which is the black hat, and which we need to use most of the time, judgment, you come to an idea and you compare it to your existing patterns. 
And if it does not fit your existing patterns, quite rightly, you back away and you reject it. Movement, on the other hand, we come to an idea and we move forward from it. What does it lead to? The operating word in judgment is is. Does this fit? Is it right? Is it wrong? The operating word in movement is to. What does this lead to? What does this flow to? This is something I sometimes call rock logic. This is water logic, the logic of flow. What does it flow to? So we use provocation and movement. Now let's talk a little bit about provocation, and then we'll see examples of movement. The word po is simply a signal word. It comes from words in the English language like hypothesis, possible, suppose, and poetry. In all these, we take an idea and look at it for its forward effect. In other words, this is an hypothesis. What does it lead to? How can we check it out? This is possible. Can we confirm it? Suppose this were to happen, what would follow? In poetry, we put together words, images, metaphors, and look to see what effect we have. All that is quite different from prose. Prose means this is so, this is correct. This is looking at the possibilities, the future, what does it lead to, what happens, and so on. So what I've done is to take that syllable and to formalize it as the signal word for provocation. If you like, you can think of it as standing for provocative operation. Po, provocative operation. And what it does, it indicates that what follows is to be used for its movement value, not for its judgment value. In most languages, the word po doesn't have a specific meaning. Perhaps the nicest is an ancient Hawaiian, ancient Polynesian, where po is the chaos from which the world was eventually formed. Everything was formed from po, from potential, in a sense, in the, in the beginning. So let's look at some illustrations of that. I'll give you a rather extreme one first. One time we were looking at motor cars, and as a rather extreme provocation, we said, po, cars, should have square wheels. Now that is totally contrary to our normal experience, our normal thinking, and our black hat would have to say that's absurd, it would shake to pieces, you'd need a lot of energy, it's structurally unsound, and so on and so on. But if we're using movement, we can move on from that to some ideas as follows. We can say, well, let's imagine this square wheel. Unfortunately, it can't roll, but it does have a nice contact area with the ground. From that, we eventually develop the idea of a hub, a wheel, an inner tower at maybe 28 pounds per square inch. But outside that, a tower to much lower inflation, maybe only 7 pounds per square inch, what happens now is you roll on the inner one, but the outer one gives you greatly increased adhesion. And in fact, it works quite nicely, you get a much better grip. That's one idea. Another idea is we say, let's imagine this square we are rolling. The first thing it does is to go up on the point. That is a greater distance than that, because it's half a diagonal, so you get a bumpy ride. But since this is going to happen in a regular, predictable fashion, if your suspension gets shorter, you get a smooth ride. That leads to the idea for a vehicle for going over rough terrain. Here's your vehicle. And let's imagine we have something in front to sense the roughness of the ground. This is signaled back, so when the wheel comes to the bump, the suspension raises the wheel above the bump, or just on top of it, puts it down the other side. So now we have a vehicle which flows over the ground instead of bumping over the ground. This was an idea suggested maybe 15 years ago. It's now coming about. It's called intelligent suspension or active suspension. Lotus were the first to work on it, and now Honda and Volvo are working on it, whereby we have a hydraulic system with a very fine pressure sensing and an adjustment in order to, so the axle follows the profile of the ground. Rather like when you run over bumpy ground, you don't bump, you raise your legs, and so on. If you put a light on the side of such a car, and take a long a photograph of the long exposure. In a normal car, when you hit a bump, you get a bump. Here it's 
completely smooth. The bumps simply don't exist because you're flowing over them. So there we go from an apparently mad idea, mad provocation, end up with something quite normal. It's not, a, not difficult to do, but what it does require is, in your mind, that willingness to take an idea forward. 